gift of anger, an interview with Arun Gandhi. Hello. Aloha. Good morning, Arun. Good morning. Aloha. Tell us about the title of the book. How could anger be a gift? Well, that's what my grandfather told me. And it's a, he says that anger is a very powerful emotion which uh, is almost like uh, fuel to the automobile. If you don't put fuel in the automobile, it will not work. But if, And so if we don't have anger in us, it, we won't do many of the things that we are supposed to do. So in that sense, anger is a gift a powerful gift, but we have not understood it and therefore we end up abusing anger instead of using it uh, intelligently for the good of humanity. And for yourself, you were born in 1934 in Durban, South Africa, but you had reflected in many of your discussions that growing up as a young boy you had felt the discriminatory apartheid. Yeah, there was a lot of there was a lot of prejudice there against people of color, and uh, I was beaten up when I was a little boy by white people because they thought I was too black, and then by black people because they thought I was too white, and, uh, and there was. I, I was very angry and uh, and so I wanted to fight back again. So how did coming to the ashram with your grandfather, how did that help you to, to look at a different side of anger? Because in some of your discussions you talked about, and as you just said, you, you wanted that revenge. How, how did that reflection and spending the time with your grandfather reveal a different use of anger. Well, when he explained this to me and he started teaching me about it and he asked me, uh, every time you get angry, don't act on it, don't say anything or do anything, but write an anger journal. But write a journal with the intention of finding a solution to the problem and then commit yourself to finding a solution. And I did this for many years, and I must say it helped me considerably in learning how to uh, deal with my anger. And it's a process that is a lifelong process. I can't say that I am completely, uh, I have overcome anger. It is something that you have to work on every day because every day brings new challenges. And, uh, and so you have to have the uh, ability to deal with those challenges uh, in an intelligent way rather than uh, uh, abusing it. This book about your grandfather's teachings is dedicated to your grandchildren. Why is it important to teach our children about the past as we have hope for their future? Because I think this is a very important lesson of anger which causes 80, more than 80% of the violence in humanity uh, has been neglected for a long time. We haven't taught it to our children, we, haven't, we weren't taught about it ourselves and we, we still don't want to talk about it, we don't want to teach it. We ignore it completely and the result is that everybody is left to their own uh, devices to find ways of dealing with it and so everybody ends up uh, abusing it. So I think that if we reach out to young people and start teaching them, at least then the new generation that comes up will be better equipped to deal with uh, the anger. You speak a little bit about, and I think it's a very important point, that in the world today, there's more passive violence than there is a lot of times physical. Why is it that we, 
misinterpret and we don't recognize our own passes becomes discrimination, it becomes racism, it becomes so many things. How, how do yeah. we bring about an understanding of some of the things that we're, we just naturally don't even recognize the wrongs of humanity? Yeah, and you see, the problem is uh, the, at the root of all the evil is materialism. When we decided to have a materialistic lifestyle and we became uh, part of the whole materialistic life, uh, we became very greedy and selfish and self-centered. And we want everything for ourselves. We want uh, to grab as big a portion of the pie for ourselves as possible and we even tell our children when they are growing up that they have to be successful in life and reach the top that don't bother about anybody else you just uh, you know think about yourself we plant those seeds of selfishness in our children and uh, our measure of success is material how much money the person makes, what kind of car the person drives, what kind of a home they have, how many possessions they have. So it's always material possessions that define the success of a person. And, uh, and all of that has created this whole culture of violence, a culture of violence that has seeped so deeply in us that, uh, you know, it's uh, taken control of everything. And, and that culture of violence uh, then leads to all this passive violence because we are constantly exploiting people, we are wanting, uh, you know, things for ourselves, we want cheap labor, we want somebody to do all the work, slave work for us. And all of these things add up and we created this whole network of passive violence which uh, we have not even, uh, you know, given any thought to. And so we practice it every day in our life without even knowing that we are being violent towards other people. And you brought up that, you know, uh, we're, we're living in a world of abundance, yet with so many who are homeless or in poverty, how can we help others to simply live, to have basic human rights, security of shelter, water, food, toilets, even even just medical access? Yeah, we have uh, created this kind of a lifestyle because we are greedy and, and we want everything for ourselves. And uh, so we, you know, waste food, we throw away so much food uh, and we throw away so many other things that everyday people can use. So we have created this diversity between people, economic diversity and also religious and political and other diversities there. And half of the world is living in poverty and they have no food. And yet we uh, in the United States throw away 160 billion dollars worth of food every year. So that is the worst form of violence. And what we need now is to create caring, compassionate societies, communities where we would care for each other and we will help each other, uplift them and give them a better standard of life. Unless we do that, we are going to go deeper and deeper into violence and uh, we'll be consumed by it. You speak a lot about, and your grandfather taught you much about action. So how can we create a chain reaction of respect, hope and love and dignity for others, to, to uplift them so they can see their human potential? Well, we have to uh, be willing to sacrifice something. We need to uh, have that compassion for, pe uh, for people and, and uh, do whatever little we can. That's why I 
take a group every year on the Gandhi Legacy Tour to India where I have identified uh, 10 programs. There are many programs, but I have just taken 10 of them where individuals, one person, started working for the poor people and transformed the lives of millions. And uh, so it, it's a way of uh, to inspire people that one person can make a difference in the life of many people. And, uh, you know, we have to learn from that. And if all of us uh, can do such things, then we will be able to change this world. But if we all sit back and say, well, what can one person do? Then nobody will do anything. And, and that's what is happening today. You know, in the book, you talk about the five pillars of nonviolence, respect, understanding, acceptance, appreciation, and compassion. And you, you speak, one of the themes is about equality. Yeah. Gave me a quote several years ago when we were talking about Syria and some of the other conflicts. And again, we're back at that point. You said that we are materially wealthy, but morally bankrupt. What, what is yeah. it you would like to say to the President of the United States, our world leaders in the United Nations of where we are right now with the Middle East? Well, I would say that, uh, you know, obviously fighting and war does not help resolve that issue. What we need to do is to look at the problem. When we use violence to resolve uh, conflicts, we beat up on each other and we forget the problem. We put the problem aside and we attack the people. And yet what we need to do is that all of us together need to focus our attention on what is the problem there and, and try to resolve that problem. So, you know, this fighting is not going to achieve anything. It's just going to kill a lot of people and destroy uh, everything for forever. Uh, and, you know, we have the example of World War II. We sacrificed more than 60 billion human lives. Uh, and all that we achieved was to get rid of Hitler and Nazism. But the hate and prejudice that they profess still continues to threaten us and, and uh, still continues to thrive uh, all over the world. So what did we sacrifice 60 million people for? What do you think your grandfather would say? Because we seem to come back to at the hands of war, this mass human suffrage. And here we are, how many years later after World War II? So how can we get out in the streets and ask for justice? And, and not this revenge, because you always talk about that no nation can live in isolation. Right. Well, the, the thing is that, you know, we are so trapped in materialism. Uh, in our daily life, we want to be sure that we have our home and our jobs and our security and economic security and be able to buy all the things that is produced in the market that uh, we don't uh, take any interest in what the government is doing and what the people are doing and, uh, and uh, so we don't protest about it. We just keep quiet and, and so the government functions on its own without the support of the people and the people just keep silent. So we need to get out of that trap. And we need to realize that, uh, you know, this world is our world and we need to do something to keep it and preserve it for posterity and, and not ruin it. And a lot of what your grandfather and you talk about is, is fear. And, and so how, yeah. do we, how do we work through, because you said peace is not the absence of war or violence, but how do we build relationships, especially with those we are in conflict or of, in fear of? Yeah, because we have to find out what is the conflict and see how we can resolve that conflict uh, and not 
be afraid of people. Uh, I mean, you know, if we focus on the problem and try to reach out uh, and uh, and recreate the United Nations, you know, the United Nations was a very good concept, but it was messed up in the Cold War uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union, and and uh, that mentality of the Cold War still persists in the United Nations. What we now need to do is to revamp the United Nations and make it an international body where we can sit down as adults and talk about the conflicts of the world and try to find solutions to those conflicts. And everybody must contribute to helping uh, bring about a solution to that conflict. And you know, this uh, business of having a security council and treating certain nations uh, as more uh, powerful than the rest, uh, that uh, has to go. We all must be equal, we all have equal voice, and we all should contribute equally to, uh, to preserve this world. Because we must realize that the security and stability of any country depends on the security and stability of the whole world. If we can't preserve this world, this nobody, no country in the world is going to survive if the rest of the world goes down the drain. And that also goes for the environment. How, as a world community, how would you rate us on our environment? Because our, our food, our land, our water is, is vital to a, are living. Well, we are exploiting everything. We are exploiting the environment. We are exploiting nature. We we have become uh, so uh, greedy and, and, and we think we are powerful that we can destroy everything and exploit everything and use it up. Uh, and, and it's, you know, what we see now, the changes in the weather pattern and, and all the things that are happening, uh, the melting of the uh, the ice and, and all that is, is the beginning of uh, the end. You know, one of the things I know that you've been working on and hoping for, in 2007 you lost your wife, Sunada, and it's been your hope to establish a school in India. How's the progress and what is it you would like the school to, to uh, teach? What philosophy and basics would that encompass? Well, uh, the primary purpose of the school is there are millions of children who are living in poverty and they're caught in the trap and they can't get out of it and uh, so you know generation after generation live in ignorance and poverty and destitution uh, and uh, miserable life so what we are trying to do is to rescue as many of these children as we can and and give them uh, the means to uh, uh, you know uh, to do something to put, uh, so that they can uh, have a better economic uh, standing. Uh, we are teaching them how to read and write so that they are able to increase their knowledge and just giving them a helping hand so that uh, their life of poverty can end and they can have hope for the future. You know, uh, in the past couple of weeks, uh, the Trump administration had talked about cutting off things like Meals for Wheels and uh, food programs for children. How important in education, because these are usually programs where uh, the child receives maybe an afternoon snack or, or something to compensate for uh, during the day and maybe no food at home. How important is it that we focus on, on uplifting the child and in the nourishment because they're saying that there's no data saying that giving a child a meal or a snack is helping them with their education. What are we missing? 
Well, we are missing everything. We are missing compassion. We are missing understanding. We are missing love. Uh, and he doesn't care because he wants money to build more weapons and uh, and uh, create more wars. And they think that that is going to solve the world's problems. But if they have poverty in the country itself, here in, in the United States, we have millions of people who are hungry, which is a shame that the country that is supposed to be the most powerful and so rich, uh, that they should have millions of people who are uh, going hungry and uh, not getting proper education. And the education system itself has been so corrupted now that uh, you know, even uh, middle class students find it difficult to go for higher education because it's so expensive. A uh, young boy or a girl starting life with a debt of fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 on their head because of their education uh, is unthinkable. I mean, how do we, uh, you know, even justify such kind of life? Uh, and this is what is happening and that is why now they have to go and look for technologists and other uh, technically, uh, you know, um, uh, knowledgeable people from outside and bring them into this country to uh, to do all the research and, and uh, things like that. And why why can't we have our own people who can uh, do that if we make education a top priority instead of making the military a top priority? And, and you talked a little bit in the book about how Wars build walls and divides us. Yeah. Yeah, it divides us. We have already divided so many of us. And now we still continue to build walls and, and divide people in other ways. And uh, it's all very negative. With this kind of division of people is just uh, destructive. Well, we're talking with Arun Gandhi and his newest book, The Gift of Anger, which was in cooperation with Jeter Publishing and Simon and Schuscher. I just think it's so important because your book is not just for the young. This is a, a book for the world, the nation, young and old. And it's yeah. just so good to see you continue your work and, and as you said, you're still learning every day. And so where we can yes. take bits and pieces, give us a little bit of insight. You mentioned about 11 lessons. What, what are some of the lessons that we can uh, learn in the gift of anger? Well, the most important lesson is to do the introspection of ourselves and find out what are our weaknesses uh, and uh, do this truthfully and honestly and make a list of those weaknesses and start working on transforming those weaknesses into strength. And I don't mean strength in the uh, physical sense, but strength in the moral sense. We, we need to regenerate ourselves in, uh, in our moral strength rather than in just in physical strength. And you talk a little bit about solitude. Why is it, is it important to have solitude? Well, we have to uh, have time to think about ourselves, think, go within ourselves and think about what are our obligations and what are we doing and what is our life about. 